Well, I'd like to say thank you for having me again. And um, I could talk all night on this subject, but I'm 30 years plus in now to the archival research and my new moniker is dedicated to preserving the legacy of the great mediums. That is my mission, absolutely. I am going under every rock, nook and cranny with an emphasis because of the, where I live, mostly on the physical mediums in America. But I am just searching out what they've done and what they've left to the world. And the great body of, of let's just call it historical spiritualism because if you go back in time, spiritualism, the indigenous cultures thousands of years ago predating historic spiritualism, modern spiritualism. The Native Americans were the masters of psychic laws. They were brought up, they weren't, uh, they were conditioned to believe and, and know their power in the psychic plane. And uh, the Mayans, it goes on and on. The Egyptians, these are masters of psychic laws. But my particular calling, thanks to Emily French, is modern uh, spiritualism. And even though it's three decades, half of my life, uh, and in my particular case, everybody has to speak for themselves, uh, a woman who I loved, who was 28 years old, she passed away from leukemia, and uh, her clairvoyant visions towards the end of her life in Johns Hopkins Hospital just woke me up to the afterlife. And from that point, I, I stopped where I, where I was dedicated to a musical career, stopped in my tracks. And to the shock of many, I said, I'm stopping this career and I'm gonna go in search of the answers to life after death myself, with no help from anybody. Certainly not the private Catholic schools that I was brought up in. Of course, they have nothing nothing to say of any substance. So I started the search on my own, but the clairvoyant visions of the young lady who passed away was so, so colossally evidential that you cannot possibly deny what, what happened. The sun came and uh, there's just nothing that could possibly, it took me off the course of my life and changed the whole thing. So here I am 30 years later, and like Craig and other researchers, I'm still on the path, unearthing the great legacy of the mediums. So I'm eight books in, I've got ideas for probably five other books. I'm gonna keep going. Uh, it's unfortunate to me, I was trying to explain this to my wife earlier tonight, what my theme was gonna to be tonight. And it, it essentially is, I'm not sure if I'll explain it correctly, but I'll try, that when you are that deep into a subject, could be baseball, football, whatever it is, you study the subject for that long, you, you find out things that you never, I'm still unearthing things that I, I, I'm, I just, I just takes my breath away. The great mediums, what they, what they left. So, our, we had 100 years, approximately, which I call the century of wonders. If anybody who knows my work knows that, that statement I use. 1848, which was the beginning, essentially, of modern American spiritualism, the Fox Sisters in Hyattsville. It's one, one hour from my house to... I would say uh, 110 years later, even though the great Leslie Flint and David LeBaron were the last two really, truly incredible independent voice uh, mediums. We all know Leslie Flint, but David LeBaron, he was in Seattle. My wife sat with him probably 300 times. Incredible uh, mediumistic events. 
Anyways, the whole entire history of the subject of spiritualism, examined by some of the greatest minds who have ever lived, Sir William Crooks, Sir Oliver Lodge, Sir William Barrett, Arthur Conan Doyle, on and on and on it goes, the greatest minds. The whole subject seemed to be swept under the carpet by science, by the church, materialism. The 19th century came, and here comes materialism. My theory, and I think it's a legitimate one after 30 years, is the spirits knew this. They knew what was coming. Look at the world now. Now it's, you know what it is, you know, cell phone towers. And we have who knows who's in the seance room with a cell phone recording everything. The whole thing. So I think, I now used to think it's a human problem. But... I now think the spirits knew back then we're opening the portals and we're going to give you a titanic outpouring of spiritual events, which they did. So archiving the, the legacy of the great mediums to me is very important. Hopefully we can bring it from the cemetery of obscurity into the present because the fact of life after death, spirit return has been proven thousands and thousands and thousands of times. It's already been proved. Seems like we as a culture, we're not progressing. You know what I'm saying? I just get that feeling that it needs to be brought forward instead of coming from the cemetery. So I, I'm trying to bring it forward into the mainstream of thought that the world can benefit. The what good then is everything, unless you study the subject, I, I'm staggered by the great things that the spirits of the mediums have done for this world, what the spirits have said, what they have done. It is, it's astonishing to me that it's buried where it could change the world. If the, if the world knew it could live by the teachings of what the spirits have already said, the world would transform overnight, absolutely transform overnight. So, I'm giving it my best shot, and until my last breath, everyone will know that I did the best I could to bring the stories of these wonder workers to the light of day. Yeah. Latest one is Spectral Evidence 3, and it's I'm, I'm unearthing trumpet mediums from New Zealand, the Mrs. Moore from Scotland, Mercia Swain, a tremendous independent voice from Buffalo. Uh, I'm just going at it. I'm, I'm, I'm going to have a chapter on psychometry. Emma Harding, Britain. I'm just now doing a chapter on, to me, one of the, one of the most wondrous moments in spiritualism. And I will challenge anyone. I don't care who you are or what academic level you are, try to get your head around this one. Emma Harding Britain, born in England. She died in 1899. As far as trance address. Abraham Lincoln is assassinated. The very next day, Emma Harding Britain is approached by many very influential individuals and they want her to give the funeral oration. She says, yes, she's 42 years old. This is a trans address. Where can the critics go with this one? With one day notice, 3,000 people, Cooper Hall, New York City, walks out on stage and goes into trance. It gives one of the most colossal funeral orations in history about Abraham Lincoln. I would like a critic to sit here and explain to me, I would say, how do you explain this colossal moment in, in history? These are truly historic events. And the oration is so long, I couldn't include it in my book because people would probably be falling asleep. But I almost included the whole thing, but I had to edit it. 
I was sorry to, and I was, I've, I'm still battling with it right now, whether to include the whole thing. But I have to say to myself, are people going to really sit down and read the whole thing? You know what I'm saying? I mean, you have to wonder if people's interests are there with you people. Sure it is. But, you know what I'm saying? It's a fine line with the research. Uh, how far to go? You don't want to oversaturate people, but out of honor to Emma Harding Britton and Abraham Lincoln, uh, I'm tempted to include the whole thing, but we'll see where that goes. And um, what else do I have? I'm going to do, uh, oh, as far as Edward Randall with Emily French. I found the Edward Randall archives at the University of Michigan. It's truly, it's like finding gold at Sutter's Mill in California back in 1848. Found, I knew it was there, but I finally got a hold of one of the secretaries of the uh, Rare Books Library in Michigan, and Edward Randall left an archive of material. A lot of it was unpublished. It had to do, of course, with one of the greats, Emily French. So I'll, I'll, I'll do anything as far as Emily French. You know, she's one of my heroes. So uh, I may have to go there. It's going to be a colossally long trip to do it, but I just might. Being a uh, research geek, that's what it takes. Craig knows this. It takes going the extra mile. So, and I'm going to have, uh, I'm going to add uh, as a gift to everyone. I have the first, my first book, The French Revelation, of course. I've always said the teachings which came through uh, Emily French with Edward Randall, the famous lawyer having secretaries and stenographers in the darkened, Stygian darkened seance room, taking down every word they said. Um, I've always said if the world could abide by the teachings in that book alone, the world would change overnight. So, I'm open so the to research, so, so the research that you're doing at the moment, is that for Spectral 3? Spectral Evidence 3. Spectral Evidence 3, okay. 26,000 words into it. And that's, I'm probably halfway through. And then I have other ideas. I have definitely other ideas. I have, I'm just going to keep pushing this stuff forward until hopefully it somehow, some way it gets into the mainstream of thought. It just makes me sad that when you're this far into it, I mean, half of my life, literally half. It's so wondrous and beautiful. And it's just beautiful beyond words that I really wish the world could know what happened with people like Emily French and, and Adder Wright and the Sisters Moore and Buffalo, all of it. I wish the world could know this. I really do. So, yeah, uh, Spectral Evidence 3, number, number nine coming and rest assured I am just as enthused just as aggressive as ever plowing ahead further to my last breath I will to bring these truths uh, something to leave to the future generations that's what I'm going to do so, so Riley, tell us about a little bit more about Emma Harding Britton. A lot of people here uh, don't know her at all. Can you give us a little bit of a background on her? She was born like in Manchester. Uh, well, she died in 1899. She was till 1820s, 1830s, Manchester. Uh, she exhibited prodigy musical abilities at a very young age. At 11 years of age, she was teaching, teaching music at 11. 11 years old, I was in my pajamas sitting on the couch look, watching Mickey Mo or Mighty Mouse. On the <laughs> she was teaching music. She went to a spiritualist uh, event in New York City about 20 years into her life. And the medium there in trance told her that she had mediumistic gifts. 
And uh, this she developed, and uh, I believe she had a genius IQ because her musical prodigy, the shows on Broadway, I mean, her story is absolutely incredible. Um, so after a while, she exhibited the gift of trance. And I've always been fascinated by extemporaneous addresses, which to me could quite possibly be the severest test of any medium is to be, especially young, like uh, Cora Richmond, one of my heroes, 18 years old, basically illiterate, but in trance, could be given any scientific question, and the, her elocution and brilliance. Same way with Emma Harding Britain, she established right away her ability under the severest test conditions to have in front of an audience, the audience could form a, a little body of, of thinkers and they could come up with a question to put forward any scientific level. So Emma, Hard, Emma Harding Britain, uh, that, that became her, her forte. I have uh, trance addresses of hers on different subjects I'm going to include in the book. I've always been astounded by, by this form of mediumship. And you don't see it anymore today at all. You don't, not trans address, not to this level, N-O. So uh, look her name up and do research. You can find a lot of stuff and uh, just Google her name, Emma Harding Britton, B-R-I-T-T-E-N. H Harding is H-A-R-D-I-N-G-E, Emma Harding Britton. And you'll find, you'll find all kinds of things. I read her autobiography written by her sister, uh, Mrs. Wilkinson. And uh, one of the latest works I've been reading of hers, actually I finished it, was the most brilliant thing I've ever read on the formation of the Christian belief. It's called The Faith, Faiths, Facts, and Frauds of Re Religious History. And this is all trance addresses by the spirits saying were the foundations of religion itself. It's essentially, I'm not going to get into this because we could spend literally hours on this one. Man simply just looked up to the heavens and then the basis of all religious belief starts with that. It's all some astrological beginnings, but it is truly astonishing. And uh, there's going to be a chapter on psychometry, which is another, another uh, aspect of mediumship, which is truly astonishing. I'm going to include a chapter on the biologist, William Denton. He was a geologist, I mean, whose wife was a, a psychometrist. You could place any object in her hands, and she would basically tell you the history of that object, which, which says a lot right there. You know, the rocks, uh, it's almost as if rocks have memory. Like, there's no such thing as anything that's inanimate. But The Soul of Things, the book by William Dutton, 1883, is absolutely remarkable. It's a body of work that, once again, should be on the bestseller list, New York Times bestseller list. It is truly astounding because he was a geologist. So the history of objects, bones, fragments, prehistoric, in the hands of the, of the right psychometrist, which is true mediumship, can tell you the history of that object. And it's truly astounding. So I'm gonna include an edited chapter on that too. And uh, on, on we go. David LeBaron, he's a medium. Uh, in Seattle. Uh, Caroline could tell you much more about it than me, even though but she won't come on camera. I'm sure she won't. Um, he was a physical medium. He died in 1996, right? Right around the time Leslie Flint passed away. And um, he had trumpet. He had etherealizations, 
spirits would come out of the cabinet and you could see through them like a, like a negative photograph. Uh, he had airports, but mostly it was uh, theorizations and materializations and teachings from different times of the week. He would have uh, teachings from the spirits. They'd come through and they'd said, this specific night is just teachings and the spirit would materialize and come out and, and give their teachings. And uh, Caroline went to, she went first as a skeptic. This is back in the early 90s. And her father came through. And there was no question whatsoever about these, these people knew nothing about her. And her father came through. And then her guide came through and various things happened because Caroline's a powerful medium unto herself. She's a very well-known clairvoyant. Um, I think that her uh, mediumistic essence added to the seances. We all know this, you know, the circle is as good as the, the energy, the energy patterns of the sitters, you know, the, this is the great science of, of sitting. So Caroline added a great deal of mediumistic power to the circle so that the uh, manifestations were much more powerful. And she, she was able to experience a lot of things. She sat probably for 200 times or more with the Baron. So she saw a great deal. But he was basically, uh, he was known in that area, but not really known to the level of Leslie Flint, you know. But uh, I'll, I'll, I'll probably do some work on him. But once again, though, David LeBaron, then there's probably, there's probably hundreds and hundreds of mediums out there or were out there who never, they were never documented. For every one powerful, great physical medium, there's probably thousands uh, that were never known. Lucky me, um, only due to the the nonstop research, have I been able to find these rare books? A lot of them you cannot even find anymore. You can't find certain books. I look up, I try to find copies of some of the books I have. I just can't find them. So when I got these, a lot of books I collected were in the early 90s, uh, the old fashioned way. I, I did not even have a computer when I wrote my first book. So I did everything uh, the old fashioned way. But a lot of mediums, we're not documented. So David LeBaron is an example of that. Leslie Flint, of course, has, you know, David LeBaron. I'm going to try to find more about him. So he passed away in 1996. James yeah, Dixon. James Dixon. I'm, I'm stupefied. I mean, he, I mean, in broad daylight. And, and some of the stories are remarkable. But there has to be some form of ectoplasmic force. But I can tell you this. I can study for 50 more years, and I will not be allowed to know the laws of what, what happens with spirit. None of us are going to be able to know all the answers. We're just not going to be allowed to know. That's how it works. They're not going to tell us everything. And as far as daylight, daylight materialization, that one is, Dixon was one of the only ones, I mean, full, walk right through the living room in the sunlight. I, I don't know. The ectoplasm must have been so strong. Uh, I wish I could find a way to talk to any, any spirit guide about that one. But I don't, I don't know. Mirabelli was another one, wasn't he? Uh, yeah. In Brazil. Mm -hmm. He had daylight materializations. Not to the and, extent of Dixon, but he did, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so so this, this is my, my question. When first documented um, ectoplasmic direct voice medium who, who was actually using a voice box, I'm trying to work out, it seems that the... Uh, the voice box, a lot of them were using trumpets in the early days. 
they were mm. using, uh, and it, it were those trumpet mediums were able to uh, operate in light. Um, some, uh, were, uh, mm-hmm. so, some, some were, were some were, and and I, I, it su- suggested that they were not using ectoplasm; they were using uh, like natural energy, like the skull, the skull group. Well, once again, that's a suggestion, and I just do not think that we will quite possibly ever understand what that means uh, sitting in where we are. But I, I can only say that if a daylight trumpet, it must be the, the shadowing of the inside of the actual trumpet, creating a little tiny cabinet. I do not know how to answer that question of how some new energy can, can, can facilitate daylight anything. I don't know how that works because I know that the light Light has a detrimental effect on physical manifestations, yes. But back in Ohio, 1800s, Jonathan Coons in Ohio, his family were one of the first uh, to use the trumpet. And John King, of course, the famous spirit guide. I almost feel like I know him like a grandfather. He essentially invented the trumpet. He also... He also gave directions to build the cabinet that the Davenport brothers used when they went on tour to give them a, you know, in the front of a, pu- a public audience in, in daylight or in light, the cabinet that they raised up on the wooden horses to provide darkness for them. He, he gave directions to design that too. So King was, King, the spirit guide King, uh, invented the trumpet and, and the cabinet, actually. But the trumpet uh, with daylight or subdued light, not Stygian darkness, I would put a Jonathan Coons right before the Davenport brothers. So it was 18, 1840s, Jonathan Coons family in Ohio. They lived out in the country and the whole family were mediums. And they were viciously attacked by uh, literally attacked. Their house was under siege numerous times from the the unbelievers. But Coons, I would say, was one of the first to use semi semi darkness for the trumpet. Ed Wright also uh, could put a trumpet down in a room with a, with a full light and and be several feet away, and the uh, you can casually say to someone, I'll go over there and ask a question and see if the spirits talk. And many times they would, right out of the trumpet in the daylight. <laughs> can you imagine that? The trumpet sitting on the couch and then just going over and having a conversation with the trumpet. So she, she wasn't attached to the trumpet. The trumpet was uh, just sort of lying on the floor. Oh, numerous times at her right. Numerous. It, uh, it's yeah. just uh, over there on the couch. And she would casually say, go over, and, go over and see if you can feel anything. And on numerous occasions with Ed Wright, a uh, person could walk over there and just, hello, who's there? And someone would speak out of the trumpet. Very, very powerful. But I think it, well, I don't have any theory. I think it was either the darkness of the trumpet itself inside the trumpet or some law that we are not allowed to know. As far as daylight manifestations, I haven't heard any theory. And therefore, I accept it as we're not meant to know, maybe. Can't know everything. I, I've read of similar things like this happening in indigenous ceremonies of yes. uh, direct voice mediumship. Oh, sure. Uh, I mean, masters. Every, everything that we have. It's interesting. We, uh, next week, we, we have... Um, Lionel Friedberg coming on, who has written a book on African shamans and right. his his contact with the African shamans. I th- I don't think we know enough about shamanic mediumship, and I think we can learn a lot about physical mediumship if we actually start looking at indigenous mediumship. If you can find, see, it's, it's it all comes down to the research. It takes people to go out and research it, and then archive it and document it. 
Otherwise, no one's going to know what the hell happened. That's why I think that the th we should do everything we can to bring. We should have. We, we should have uh, advanced as a civilization. We could have advanced way more than this if the truths that had already been documented had been mainstream thought. You know, what I'm saying we would have been way more advanced as a civilization. If the truth of what happened, even like the, uh, the uh, trans address with Emma Harding Britain, nobody, nobody knows about that. The day after Lincoln was shot, and nobody knows about this. 3,000 people at the Cooper Institute, she gave an hour and a half straight, absolutely mind-boggling, beautiful, lofty address about Lincoln. And it's just wiped out in the uh, Cemetery of Obscurity. But speaking of shamans, I've been to the rainforest with my wife, been three times, and we ingested ayahuasca. I documented this in my book, The Hereafter. And you want to talk about shamans. There was a, looked like he was 110 years old. He walked 15 miles through the rainforest to get to us barefoot. He was a revered priest. All the Shwa Indians bowed when he came out. He looked like a skeleton. But... There was a person walking in several worlds because his, his vision of the world was so far, so different from us. And it was an incredible experience. He could just look right through you.